Hi, thank you very much and good morning. Uh, can everyone hear me? I was told actually that it might be a little uh, quiet back there. Sounds like it's fine. Okay, great, thank you. So. Um, what I want to talk about today is what I think is uh, the key area in investing in healthcare and biology in the future. And by the future, I mean both the next five to 10 years as much as also the next 50 years. Actually, so I had some slides. I don't know if uh, they're going to come up or not. Let me just... Clicker. Oh, okay. Fantastic. Yeah. Great. So when I think about uh, the, where biology and healthcare is going, the first question to ask is, what is the sort of challenge that's holding us back? Why is healthcare so expensive, so, uh, so challenging? And really, from my perspective, the problem is that biology is extremely complicated. So if you look at a cell the way you'd look at like a circuit, as we're looking at here, this is a biochemical circuit of the cell, it's complicated. And it's you know, hard for me to even just understate how complicated it is, or hard to overstate how complicated it is. You know, if you zoom out from just this little part of it, you start to see that even for just a small part of biology, a small part of the cell, it's really just way too complicated for a human mind to wrap uh, one's head around. And frankly, this is the part that's really, I think, holding us back in many ways from our ability to sort of make major advances in biology. If we understood it better, we could approach biology the way we approach other areas like physics and engineering and so on. Okay, so is there no hope for this? Well, I think the reason why I'm here right now is that there is, I think, a major sea change in our ability to understand biology. And I'll talk about its implications, but first let me talk about what that change is. So that change, I think, is the advent of artificial intelligence. And you've heard so much about it. I think one of my favorite, favorite examples is AlphaGo that we're showing here. So, um, you know, for the longest time, Go was believed to be essentially an impossible game to win uh, for a computer. That it was just too complicated. And I think with the advent of uh, machine learning, especially recent deep learning methods, it's kind of amazing that AlphaGo now can beat uh, presumably the very best players um, on the planet, very best human players. And actually, I don't know if any of you are Go aficionados, but it was really interesting reading the transcripts of people following the match, the way they would follow like a cricket match or a baseball match. Uh, the way they were describing it is that they felt that they were watching an artificial intelligence, like an alien intelligence playing the game because it was using moves and coming up with insights that no human had ever had before. And I think the key takeaway from this is that a human didn't give the computer rules for how to play. It figured it out on its own. And I think that is this major shift from more traditional machine learning to what we're seeing in artificial intelligence now, the ability for the computer to figure out a lot of the key things without having been told. So how is this possible? Well, I'll just give you a very, very brief primer on how artificial intelligence works, especially to sort of set the stage for how it could be applicable in biology and for investments. So if we think about these new methods in deep learning, the first successes were in recognizing images. And you know, there are tons of reasons to recognize images, uh, you know, from security to convenience to um, even self-driving cars and so on. And what's important here is that there wasn't sort of different methods devised for different types of images. There was one method that could be repeated over and over again. So what happens in this deep neural net is that images are fed at the bottom. And you know, images are made of pixels, and then what the machine does is that through AI, it gets a higher and higher order understanding from shapes to features to faces to the point where it can actually identify a specific face. And the key thing here and the key takeaway point is that this process is repeatable. So you could do this for faces, but you could do this for chairs, you could do this for um, cars, you could do this for elephants, you know, any of these areas. Okay, well, how is this applicable to biology? Well, remember I mentioned that biology is very, very complicated, much like Go is very complicated, and that we cannot give the computer the rules because, frankly, we don't understand them ourselves. So if we can't give the computer the rules, but the computer now has the ability to learn them, what could we do? Well, when uh, one of the companies I invest in, Freenome, applies this type of technology to looking at blood samples from cancer patients, where they look at DNA and actually other analytes to try to detect cancer early. The challenge here is that the immune system has a signature about whether you have cancer or not, maybe stage zero colorectal cancer, or stage one lung cancer, but we don't understand it. But here's a, a perfect opportunity for where AI can step in and understand it for us. And actually works very much like we did for images. That instead of images on the, on the bottom coming in, we have DNA bases or other analytes coming in. And higher and higher order processes get learned. 
to the point where it can make a very specific diagnosis. And this could be for early screening, this could be for picking which drug would be the best, this could be for com companion diagnostics, preventive diagnostics, a, a whole range of areas involved with cancer. And frankly, when you're learning the immune system, there's no reason why this has to be limited to cancer. And so this is an example of where there is just a dramatic shift that's possible. What I want to talk about here is that this is just one example. And that while I think a lot of attention is applied to AI, I think AI is actually just the tip of a, a much bigger iceberg for the, the shift that we're going to see. So actually, yeah, so before I get to that, um, one, one more slide is that, so I, you know, I showed you some nice pictures, but how do we know it's really going to work? You know, it's, it's a beautiful idea, but not all beautiful ideas work or not all beautiful ideas are useful. And I think the proof is in the accuracy that when you compare different methods like Freenome with uh, cancer uh, detection or Cardiogram, which is another investment of ours that can identify um, uh, heart disease from apps, the accuracy is extremely high. And Cardiogram's recent paper published 97% accuracy. And so that really is the proof. It's statistical proof that there's something really here. And the fact that these percentages are so high is really remarkable because if you think about existing diagnostics, the accuracy is relatively low. A PSA test for prostate cancer typically has about 50% accuracy to, to calibrate. So one other question that comes up is, with, given this possibility to have so much more added um, knowledge, what will be the impact on healthcare and, and doctors? And I think there's a lot of fear that doctors will be replaced. And the argument goes something like this, is that if computers can be better at dermatology or ophthalmology or radiology, which actually either has happened or is in the process of happening now, you know, what would be the role for doctors? And I think I want to stress here is that this will never be something where you go and talk to a computer. There's just so much more that a doctor does than just do a simple diagnosis. And so the excitement, I think, it really should be that um, the future is the combination of computers and doctors, which would be greater than either doctors or computers alone. Okay. So finally, you know, a question that I often get asked is why is this happening now? You know, haven't we had machine learning for decades? Haven't we been trying to do this for decades? And I think there's actually a couple uh, key trends that have come to pass. So first off is that um, modern AI techniques are considerably more powerful than what we had 20 years ago. And that's you know, a combination of many things, somewhat algorithmic, but also very much just the amount of computer power that we have. Uh, secondly, I think this is one of the most um, uh, important points that I think a lot of people share is that um, there's now finally huge amounts of data that's available. And some of it actually just comes from very um, uh, banal reasons such that like, we can now store a petabyte of data very cheaply. So you can store and record everything. And that allows these machine learning algorithms to actually learn something. But then I think the last point here is that these algorithms are not being applied to small problems or boring problems. They're being applied in healthcare to the very, very, very most important problems. They're being applied to cancer, to heart disease, to diabetes. And you know, cancer, heart disease, top two killers in America, heart, uh, diabetes, top two, uh, top expense in America. These are the grand problems. And so I think the sort of key insight here, which I find just uh, kind of amazing, is that what we're starting to see is that through the use of machine learning and artificial intelligence, this key block that humans can't understand um, a biology is starting to be lifted. And that with, um, uh, with these tools, biology is no, limited, no longer limited by human understanding. Okay, so if you have this ability, what would you do with it? Where do we go from here? What, I mentioned that a machine learning AI is just the tip of the iceberg. What's, what's, what's the rest of it? Well, the rest of it, I think, is the fact that now we can finally engineer biology. And, you know, first off, I think uh, just the word engineering means different things to different people. So let me be, uh, sort of try to make this clear for what I mean is that what we're seeing is a shift from empiricism to engineering. So, you know, my favorite example is of engineering a, is something like engineering a bridge, like the Bay Bridge here. You know, Bay Bridge costs them about as much as a drug. So, you know, if you imagine that people built the bridge the way we design drugs, it would be very different, right? If we'd have to first build like, you know, a thousand or a million bridges and then do some simple experiments on them. And then if we get the bridge that we think is really good, we'd first have, let's say, my school for the bridge to test to see if it's safe. And then finally, you know, people who really, really want to go to San Francisco will have them go over the bridge in a, like a phase two clinical trial of sorts. You know, so we would never do that, right? Because we understand the fundamental physics and that, for that reason, we can engineer a bridge. Too often, biology, because of its complexity, um, does not look like this at all. Typically, biology looks much more empirical, much more like winning the lottery than building a bridge. 
And so with the ability to understand, I think what we're starting to see, and this is very much shaping the investments we're making, is the ability to engineer biology. And I think the investments, I think that will be the key investments over the next 10 years in this space, will be an engineering mindset that is common in tech companies applied to sort of uh, applied to the biology and healthcare area. So maybe, one, well, actually I'll skip that maybe. So, so what I wanna do in the last uh, 12 minutes here is sort of give you a little bit of a whirlwind tour of all the different places that one can engineer biology and where we're starting to see startups make a huge impact. We're gonna start at the small scale with cells, work up to organisms, the healthcare system, and even get to uh, uh, some lofty philosophy of even how engineering can fundamentally change the fundamental premise of healthcare. Okay, so let's start with cells. So I showed this complexity of this diagram to emphasize the complexity in circuits. And it's interesting to think you know, if cells are basically little factories that are wired with biochemical circuits instead of electrical circuits, it's very appealing to think that maybe we can re-engineer them the way we engineer everything else. And so the first pushback one might have is we'll say, look, that's so complicated. There's no way a human being could engineer it. But actually, there are many things that are very complicated that we engineer all the time. Um, microprocessor circuits now have billion to 10 billion transistors. I mean, I don't think there's a human being on the planet that feels that they can understand this directly, but we've built them, and how, do we, how have we built them? Well, we have tools. We have electronic design automation, or EDA tools, that allows us to build up the complexity. And what we're starting to see is these very EDA tools be applied into biology, not for electronic circuits, but for biological circuits. And so what does this look like? Well, it looks just like building a, a chip in a sense, that first you code, and actually the amazing thing is that actually in these methods um, um, that people are applying, you code even in the same language, you code in Verilog, you design and you test. So this is what people do for um, electronic circuits. Now we can do that um, um, with new uh, software from one of our investments, a company called Asimov, do this for biological circuits, where you're exactly doing the same thing of coding, actually in the same language, Verilog, designing and testing. And the testing part I think is intriguing is that you know, before you build a chip, you test it to see if it works um, through a simulation. Asimov can test these biological circuits through a simulation with 90% accuracy. And to put this in context, most biological systems like this, you might test like 100 or 1,000 or even like 100,000 to try to get one. Here, uh, if you build one, there's a 90% chance it works. You build two, there's a 99% you know, chance it works. Three is 99.9 .9 and so on. So it's something where it shifts us dramatically from sort of trying to win the lottery by buying lots of lottery tickets to actually engineering and designing. Okay, so let's go up a level. Uh, I mentioned first cells, now organisms. Uh, one of the greatest issues that I think we deal with um, is uh, type 2 diabetes. And actually this is something that uh, my family has to deal with and I've seen many friends deal with this. And there are drugs for type 2, type two diabetes, but they don't nearly work as well as we need to. Um, you know, there's, I think, uh, just millions to soon billions of people that will suffer from this. And if you look at how these drugs work compared to placebo, there is some benefit. So in our graph here, this is looking at how many people get type 2 diabetes. So this is one of these situations where up and to the right is actually bad. You want to stay down. And when you think about type 2 diabetes, it's a complicated disease. And it actually is inherently a behavioral disease. And for certain types of areas in healthcare, like an antibiotic or antifungal, medicine can work very well. Because for an antibiotic or antifungal, it's very clear what you want your small molecule to hit and target and kill. But in type 2 diabetes or other behavioral areas like anxiety or depression or smoking sensation, there's not a biological target, not a single protein that you hit, and this person will no longer have uh, anxiety. You know, unlike an antibiotic which could cure you of a bacterial infection in a week, there's no pill that'll cure you from depression in a week because it's a complex behavioral issue. But what's intriguing is that actually there are behavioral therapies that are applied, whether they're talking about for anxiety or depression or even for type 2 diabetes. And so Amada Health, another one of our investments, actually is applying behavioral therapies to help people avoid uh, getting type 2 diabetes. And what's intriguing is that these therapies are known to work that the CDC actually has uh, demonstrated this with their diabetes prevention program. It's just now the question is how do you scale and bring it to um, millions and hopefully billions of people. And Omada has worked that out using a combination of machine learning and, and mobile and other techniques. And the part that gives me the most excitement is that 
Amada's uh, uh, therapy here doesn't just do comparable to metformin, it actually has efficacy that's greater than metformin. And so this is something that I think is very shocking for people the first time they see it, that the digital therapeutic, uh, this sort of behavioral therapy, can exceed the performance of the drug. So it's getting the point now where these new types of therapies aren't sort of cheap alternatives or something like that. They're more powerful non-toxic alternatives. And in that sense, I think it would be a dramatic shift in how healthcare is thought about. Okay, so let's pop up one more level. So let's talk about the healthcare system itself. So I talked about how biology is complicated. You know, the healthcare system is complicated too. And actually, much like biology, it uh, did not have an intelligent designer that sort of laid everything out. It evolved over the, over the decades. Originally, basically for fee-for-service uh, for individuals if you needed like to fix your broken arm or something like that. And so, you know, if you go back into the 1850s, you start with just, you know, doctors coming to your house and then employers decided that it would be good to pay for this as perks for their, uh, their employees. And then finally, you started to have insurance companies on top of that, um, uh, finally, and then modern technology. When you layer all these pieces on together, they were never really designed to fit together. And in many ways, there's very little collaboration and, co uh, and uh, coordination. And so what we're starting to see is startups that are taking this as a challenge and applying engineering principles to go after the complexity of this aspect of healthcare. And um, one of my favorite, and, and so a great place to attack would be um, healthcare waste, which itself is just a $45 billion problem. And, and so one of our portfolio companies here, Patient Ping, has a, a very elegant and, and, and powerful way to approach this. So what Patient Ping does, and transparent to patients so they don't have to do anything, is at the moment you check into the ED or you check into uh, um, a doctor for a procedure, um, your payer and your provider um, get notified. And this could have huge implications for um, trying to diminish the, the use of um, the emergency room. A lot of patients should be probably more in psychological therapy or physical therapy than multiple, treat, uh, multiple trips to the emergency room. And one can't optimize the problem if we don't have the data. And so the ability for patient ping to do this has already um, uh, changed uh, the lives of many patients and, and the payers and providers to give both better care as well as cheaper care which I think is, is, is the key challenge in this, in, in healthcare today. Okay, so finally, I think in the last five minutes, I wanna sort of talk about something which is maybe the most startling thing that, uh, that I'll talk about today, which is even just changing the fundamental premise of healthcare. And so what we have coming soon is a, a major disaster, especially in the US, where the population is aging. Many, many, many people will be getting Alzheimer's, but actually with aging, it's not just Alzheimer's, heart disease, cancer, diabetes, the incidence of these diseases just skyrocket with age. And what we're starting to see is that recent scientific breakthroughs have actually opened the door to, cre to create therapeutics that actually can slow down aging and actually impact all of these diseases together. So these experiments themselves are pretty wild. So what they did is that they took two mice together they, they took two mice together, an old mouse and a young mouse, and they brought them together. And actually, as you get older, you start getting these diseases and you, you heal much slower. If you connect the circulatory system of the old mouse with the young mouse, the old mouse actually now has the same sort of um, healing properties as a younger mouse did. And so what, what they've been able to demonstrate sort of unequivocally is that there's something causative in the blood of young mice that can engender all of these properties. And so now the question is, what is it? And so I started the talk by talking about how Freenome goes through blood samples to identify cancer. So BioAge, one of our uh, investments, is going through blood samples of the young and the old with machine learning to identify potential new therapeutics and diagnostics uh, to uh, affect aging itself. And so the impact of this is, is really kind of remarkable because if you could, so let's say, slow down aging just even by 10%, Instead of getting Alzheimer's in your 80s, you'd get it in your 90s, a 10-year delay. The leading Alzheimer drug delays Alzheimer's, I think, by like half a year or three-quarter of a year. It would be over a 10 times um, um, improvement in efficacy. And that's only 10%. And I suspect the first drugs will be something like 5 or 10%, but then over time, eventually 25, 50, and, and even theoretically something closer, you know, approaching 100% is not impossible. 
And it sounds like science fiction, but if it weren't for the experiments themselves, uh, you know, I, I, I would not be convinced. But uh, the experiments are there and, and, and repeated by many groups. Now the race is on to figure out what, um, how to actually learn this. And we could not learn this complicated thing from blood if we didn't have these engineering principles and didn't have machine learning. Okay, so with that, I think that's a, a good place to end. What I want to emphasize is that what I see as the key investment areas are in taking these engineering principles for how tech companies are built and applying them to biology and healthcare extremely broadly, you know, from cells, you know, all the way up to healthcare systems. And I think this will literally fundamentally change how healthcare is done over the next decade to two decades. And I'm super excited to be a part of it on the investing side. And uh, I think we have a, a little bit of time, so maybe I'll end there. And thank you very much for your time and take a few questions. I <laughs> just an inspiring talk. <clears throat> so I just heard that you mentioned about the behavioral therapy on uh, it's more effective than actual medicines uh, on the go. So uh, as per my understanding, uh, as human beings have uh, uh, billions of years of evolution in coming up with a uh, very powerful immune system, which has been switched off by our mind conditioning. So, which means that uh, there are a lot of uh, solution for uh, general diseases uh, which can be triggered, which the internal immune system can be triggered, uh, which is currently switched off. So, what can be done in terms of AI and machine learning to bring in this in, in your understanding, um, you know, to do, make it active back? Yeah, sorry, I, I had a hard time um, parsing what you're saying. Uh, um um, but maybe we should just talk offline, I think. Uh, so, uh, yeah, we, I'm actually working with healthcare, uh, robotics applied to healthcare. So we are just thinking on these lines as well. Okay. So I would like to talk to you. Okay. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Thank you for a great presentation. Um, for someone like me who comes from an engineering background, it is really fascinating to, or intriguing to see what you just said about applying engineering to the biological situation. Um, and you gave the example of the microprocessor, for example, um, and coming from that background, there are certain tolerances within which a uh, microprocessor or any other semiconductor uh, can be predictably recreated and, um, and, and uh, created on a mass scale. To what extent uh, can that uh, aspect be considered from a biological perspective of uh, predictability and re re redoing what we have done? Yeah, so I didn't talk about the details. So the question was, um, a microprocessor can be built um, with intolerances and predictabilities, and to what extent can that be done in biology? So I mentioned that um, Asimov, can, their predictions have about 90% accuracy, which is maybe a, a lower than other e EDA tools, but much, much higher than typical biological tools. The secret, which you know, we I don't even have time to go into, but um, um, they have published papers on it, is that they have to create an environment within the cell that they've understood. And so when you think about different ways to engineer biology, machine learning is one way, but there's several other ways. Uh, another way that's common is to use what I call Legos, that they can identify key blocks within the cells and blocks that don't interact with things to create trouble. And once you've identified these Legos, then you can play with the Lego box you know, and do many things. And so it's a subset of, of what, you might, what biology can do, but it's a reliable subset. And I think that's the secret of it. Yeah, so you talked about CBT, and but also for gene therapy. Uh, oh, I see. I see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I mean, so so in the, it sounds like okay. It looks like we're out of time. Uh, okay, well, I'll do one last question. So uh, yeah, so I mean, I think those are two very different things, right? So so CBT and these behavioral diseases, I think we're already seeing uh, great efficacy. I mean, gene editing is a very different type of problem, right? And uh, um, I think the interesting question about gene editing is both where to edit and what to edit, and, and machine learning is having an impact there as well. Okay. okay, with that, I think we're out of time, so thank you all very much.